Okay, uh, continuing here in Galatians 4, and uh, I think Colleen stole my thunder today. <laughs> she did a message on the, what is the true circumcision and referred to this story that we're going to talk about that Paul uses as an allegory to illustrate a principle uh, distinct that, you know, showing us what the children of the flesh are versus the children of the spirit, which he also calls children of the promise. Uh, and actually, you know, children of the spirit, what we're talking about here is how does one walk according to the spirit? We've moved beyond just, you know, so many people think that this book is just about how does one initially get saved? It's not. It's how do we walk according to the spirit? How is the supply of the spirit, uh, made available to a already saved Christian? Where does our sense of blessing come from? And where does Christ in us as life come from? Remember he, he said in the last few verses that he travailed in birth again for them that Christ would be formed in them. And that is the same as, you know, where is that sense of blessing you had? They lost the sense of blessing. And later he's going to say you're cut off from Christ. Uh, is It's the same thing to be as being moved away from him who called them to the grace of Christ uh, in the first chapter. It, I don't know if you noticed that I look for phrases in an epistle that mean the same thing. They're like connective threads. And in Galatians, Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ in me. And, you know, I, I travail that Christ would be formed in you. And you were moved away from him who called you into the grace of Christ. And you've fallen short of grace. And you've been cut off from Christ. Which is not talking about eternal salvation, by the way. It's talking about you've lost your enjoyment of the Spirit. Um, and these phrases all mean this, refer to the same thing. Which is, you've gone back to becoming, to living like a child of the flesh versus a child of the spirit or a child of the promise which are two phrases that he's going to use here that mean the same thing to be a child of the spirit is to be someone who remember we said that the supply of the spirit works by the hearing of faith well what is the hearing of faith it believes the promise and what is the promise it's the gospel uh the child of the promise is the gospel uh is the person who believes the gospel and that person is a child of the spirit versus the person who's a child of the flesh who is uh, someone who's seeking to be perfected by the flesh and has been brought into captivity and has lost his sense of blessing even though he may be initially justified. He's not not saved. He is not enjoying the blessing. He's been separated from that sense of blessing. And he's going to use Ishmael and Isaac as examples of the children of the flesh versus the children of the promise in here. So let me read this real quick. He said, tell me, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory for these of two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which genders to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. It answers to Jerusalem, which now is, which is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate has many more children than she which has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born of the flesh uh, persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, so it is now. And then in verse 31, he says, We're not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So what's he talking about here? You have to know the story, right? Um, first of all, we are children of the promise, like Isaac was, in contrast to the others who are children of the flesh, and he's referring to Ishmael. And the story 
is in Genesis 12, which he already referred to in Galatians 3, the scripture preached the gospel to Abraham, saying, In your seed, or in you, shall all the nations be blessed. Then in Genesis 15, God confirmed a covenant with Christ, which we call the everlasting covenant. And that was when he put Abraham to sleep and was much more specific about it's your seed that's going to be blessed. And Paul tells us in Galatians 3 that that seed is ultimately Christ, with whom God confirmed the covenant. Again, in Genesis 15, when the oven and the torch passed through the pieces of the animals while Abraham was asleep. So God was confirming a covenant with Christ, and this is the basis of the gospel. This is a covenant that is in contrast in Galatians with the covenant at Mount Sinai, which was the law, which was 400 years later after the covenant that God confirmed beforehand in Christ that secured the inheritance, that's the basis of the gospel, and uh, cannot add conditions to it or disannul it. So there's two covenants he's contrasting here. Not the old covenant and the new covenant. No, the new covenant is a replacement for the Mosaic covenant. No, it's the Mosaic covenant and the everlasting covenant that is being contrasted. And the everlasting covenant is the basis that we are all generated from, whether Jew or Gentile. It's the mother of us all. It's the Jerusalem which is above. Versus the Jerusalem below that is in bondage with her children. So he's saying, look, there's this story in the Old Testament of Abraham uh, going through some motions that turn out to be an allegory. And there's two women. There's Sarah, which corresponds with the everlasting covenant. And there is Hagar, which corresponds with Mount Sinai. Okay, and the, there are two sons by these two women. The one is by a bond maiden, the other by a free woman. Uh, in verse 24, 23, it says he was born of the uh, bond woman was born after the flesh, but he was of the free woman was by the promise, which things are an allegory. Now they really happen, but they also illustrate principle, uh, spiritual principles. For these are two covenants, the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which genders to bondage, which is Hagar, but this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answers to Jerusalem, which is now, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. That Jerusalem, Hagar, corresponds with Mount Sinai, which is earthly, and is the law, and is a ministration of condemnation and death, and produces children to bondage and is typified by Hagar and Ishmael. And Sarah represents the everlasting covenant, which is from above because it's a heavenly agreement between the Father and the Son. It's not even an agreement with God and man, per se. Uh, and it generates life uh, because eventually Christ gave his life for the sheep. It appoints him as the shepherd of the sheep, and he laid his life down as his end of that covenant, and by it brings many sons into glory. Okay, that, And that is what produces, results in the heavenly city, New Jerusalem, which is the mother of us all, but is also the destination of all of us. So this is really deep stuff. You could, you could get really deep into this, and, and that's as far as I'll go with that. Just, other than to just tell the story in case you're not familiar. After, okay, so in Genesis 15, God made a covenant, confirmed it with Christ. And he made it with Abraham and his seed, which Paul said in Galatians 3 is Christ. Okay, so we know that Christ is the one with whom the covenant was cut. Christ is also the one to whom the promises were made. He's the heir and the fulfiller of all the terms which is that he would give his life to the sheep. Abraham, in Genesis 15, believed that promise, believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. That's when Abraham was officially justified according to the scripture. And it was while he was in uncircumcision, before he'd done any works, uh, 
which is important to understand because that shows us that justification is by faith apart from works. Period. There are no works that justify. It's faith alone, even apart from works. And it was like 13, 14 years before Abraham was circumcised. Uh, and Paul makes that point in, in uh, Romans 4, but also remember here, the Jews are saying, if you want to be the children of Abraham, then you need to be circumcised. Jesus was circumcised. He's the son of Abraham. And you need to be a child of Abraham in order to have the blessing. But Paul's been saying, no, you don't have a, a connection to Abraham by anything you do or by your genealogy, but by faith, you were baptized into Christ, who is the seed, who keeps the covenant and the, to whom the promise is made. And it's not a matter of circumcision or uncircumcision. It's a new creation in Christ. There's no Jew or Greek. There's not that we are the we are reckoned as if we are Christ Himself. We've put them on, and we are heirs of Abraham because Christ is the heir of Abraham. If we're in Christ, if Christ was a child of hell, we'd be children of hell. If we if he wasn't if he was destined for wrath, we'd be destined for wrath. Our destiny is Christ's destiny because we're in Him. So whatever's true of Him is true of us, and that's why we're Abraham's seed. Not because we are Abraham's seed, but because Christ is, and we're in him. Um, okay, so after Abraham was justified, now this is kind of good news for people who get involved in legalism, because we all do. The next thing that happened was Abraham knew he was supposed to have a seed, and it was through whom that through that seed that all the nations we blessed, his salvation rested in the seed coming forth. Without the seed, there was nothing. And he got restless because Sarah's womb was barren. She's past childbearing, and he was like 100 years old, or 70, a uh, little, I think he was 90. And so she suggested, why don't you go into my handmaiden, who's Hagar, the slave, and have a child by her, and we'll raise that as the heir. And so he did, and that was the beginning of 13 years of silence from God where Abraham was out of fellowship but thinking he had the legitimate heir and he was raising Ishmael in the house and uh, Hagar started to persecute and despise Sarah because she thought wait a second my son is the heir he's the he's the one and I should have a position in the house as the first wife you know, and uh, so there was strife brought into the house through this. And Abraham, there's no record that God spoke to him during that time. At the end of 13 years, and he loved Ishmael, he really did. That was his heir. Uh, he raised him. God appeared to him again and said, "No." He said, "Oh, that Ishmael might live before you." Nope. Because I'm going to come in the time of life and Sarah's going to conceive. And God totally disregarded Ishmael. And then God did visit Sarah in her barrenness. And uh, when Abraham was supposedly too old to even bear a, bring forth a seed, right? Isaac was born. And Abraham and Sarah believed. Uh, and that's how Isaac was born. And it, ha it was totally supernatural. God demonstrated that uh, this had nothing to do with you coming in and trying to help me fulfill the promise. That's not legitimate. And not only that, but God had Abraham circumcise the males and himself. And that was the beginning of the covenant of circumcision. And circumcision is representative of the cutting off of the strength, of the natural strength and its religious service to God. Circumcision is on the reproductive organ, which God was saying, Abraham, I, you know, you did this thing with Hagar and produced Ishmael, which I don't recognize. That needs to be cut off and you need to, and your, your real seed 
that's reckoned is going to be the circumcised ones. And we know from like Romans 2, it says the true Jews are those who are circumcised, not in, just in the flesh, but in the heart. And circumcision is the repudiation of your natural strength in the religious service to God, not trying to help God with the flesh. Uh, and we'll talk more about that later because he's going to use the term Israel of God in chapter 6. But uh, Paul says in Philippians 3, we are the true circumcision who serve by the Spirit and boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Circumcision represents putting off confidence in the flesh. But then when he was, after everybody was circumcised and he, he, Isaac was born, he started raising Isaac and Ishmael persecuted Isaac. There was persecution in the house. So eventually God had to have Abraham cast Hagar and Ishmael out of the house. Okay? And so even though this is really stuff that happened, Paul is saying this is an allegory representing two covenants and the way this whole thing works. Sinai and the law is typified by uh, Abraham's attempt to trying to help God produce what only God could produce. And remember at the foot of Mount Sinai when Moses gave the law, he said there's blessings and cursings. On If you do it, you're blessed. If, you're, if you don't do it, you're cursed. And we know that everybody who's under the works of the law, of the works of the law, is under the curse because cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things written in the book to do them. Nobody can. But the children of Israel said, all that you commanded, we will do. And that was self-deception. And the next 40 years was them being exhausted of their natural strength so that they could finally be circumcised in reality uh, to be brought into the good land, not in their own strength, but in God's strength. And we all have to go through that, where God shows us what our flesh is and shows us that he doesn't count it for anything. Um, he does not recognize the works of the flesh. He ignores them. He ignored Abraham's attempt to raise a seed in his house said, nope, it's going to be through Isaac, or through Sarah, sorry. So again, Hagar and Ishmael represent Abraham's time of religious service in the flesh, trying to help God do what he knew God wanted to do, but this was his... Uh, mixture, his flesh and his unbelief working together to produce Ishmael, and then that produced a child of the flesh who was a source of persecution for Isaac, and strife in Abraham's household, and dryness in Abraham's relationship with God. And that all is a picture of what the covenant of Sinai is. Those who are of that covenant and cleave to it are the children of the flesh. They're all trying to help God do what only God can do. Only God can produce the righteousness that the law points to. And he has to do, in it, do it in us by Christ as life, who is typified by Isaac. And Isaac, uh, we, like Isaac, are children of the promise and children of the spirit, which means we are those who are not trying to help God produce something, we are those who believe what God has said. And see, Abraham reached that point, according to Romans 4, when you read the account of the same thing. Romans 4 says, Abraham waxed strong in faith, giving glory to God, counting that what God had sworn he was able to do, being firmly persuaded, and uh, knowing that God gives, he didn't reckon on his own body as though dead, but and the barrenness of Sarah's womb, but... Uh, reckon that God who calls those things that are not as though they are and gives life to the dead is able to do what he promised. Now that's if you read the story in Genesis that's not what happened. He didn't just wax strong in faith giving glory to God. No he did the whole thing with Ishmael. But in the account the justified edited account that God keeps in his memory God only sees Abraham's faith. He disregards the flesh. And that gives us me hope for the Bema seed. The flesh is just burned off. It's just not referenced. When God tells the story of Abraham, he waxed strong in faith. That's the justified record. 
But when you go back and read the real history, you realize, no, he had this whole 13-year thing with Ishmael, which is the children of the flesh, and it was flesh and dryness and strife and unbelief, right? But God used it to bring Abraham to an end of himself, because I'm sure his household was miserable with all that strife. Uh, and then... God reappeared to Abraham and just reiterated the promise of the seed. He said, I'm going to visit you in the time of life. And he told Sarah too. And we know Abraham believed it because he performed the covenant that God gave him, the covenant of circumcision, which was, again, Abraham's repudiation of his natural strength in its service to God. Cutting his reproductive member, meaning, I'm not going to be able to do this. And according to Romans 4, he knew he was past childbearing age. He called his body as dead. And Sarah's womb was barren. So he knew now that it was going to have to be a miracle. Before Ishmael, it wasn't so clear. He knew he was going to have to have a seed. And he tried to figure out how to make it happen. Now he knows. No, this thing has to be of life. This has to be the time of life. This has to be the God who calls those things that are not as though they are. And gives life to the dead giving life to my mortal body and to Sarah's to conceive in the time of life. And this child, Isaac, is going to be a miracle. That's what it means to be a child of the promise and a child of the spirit. And what Paul is saying here is that's how we live. And as a Christian, you can be two kinds of people. You can be child of the flesh or child of the promise based on whether or not you are trying to perfect yourself in the flesh by going back to law keeping in which case you will persecute the sons of the promise or you are believing in God's word and his promise and the gospel under the hearing of faith and waiting for the supply of the spirit you know God said I will visit you in the time of life and he didn't tell them exactly when that would be we don't know when the fruit's going to come in our life, but God promises it. And he's waiting for us to stop with our Ishmaels and our flesh and our resolutions and our attempts to keep the law and perfect ourselves in the flesh and to come back to the gospel, which is where we get our sense of blessing, how Christ is manifested, how the spirit is supplied, how Christ is formed in us, and how eventually Christ lives in us. So again, this all goes back to, I through the law died to the law that I might live unto God. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And it's literally the way I live is waiting on God to produce the Christian life in me. It's not me trying. You think about the Christian bookstores, they're all, every book in there almost is, is Ishmael. How to have a happy marriage, how to be a good this, how to be a good leader, how to win people to the Lord, how to fill in the blanks, how to have peace, how to have joy, how to have the fruit of the Spirit, how to walk in love. These things are not given to us by instruction. They're given to us by life as Christ is manifested in us. And the, what the apostles tell us to do is look to the promise. Now, yes, the apostles do admonish us to walk worldly of the gospel and how our house should hold should be, but it doesn't tell us how. It's all based on uh, the given that you understand that the gospel is how this works. And if I tell you to do something as a Christian, I'm appealing to you based on the gospel. I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm telling you, yeah, you need to do this. And yet, I'm giving you the gospel as the means. And you still have to wait on the Lord. The law is there. You know, instructions are there. Commands are there to... Um, Give your flesh some definition so that you know what the flesh is and to cause you to know what you're, what you're looking for in Christ. 
it defines, you know, but the law bears witness to the righteousness of God, but that righteousness is manifested in Christ. And apart from Christ, there none of that righteousness is going to be manifested. We need Christ. So our life is not lived by trying to do what the law says. That produces Ishmael's. No, our life is learning to look away and even repudiate our own natural strength to be the true circumcision and have no confidence in the flesh and to be children of the promise, children of the spirit. So that's the essence of this little section of the chapter. He's just using Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac to typify these two different manners of life. And it's interesting that they all happened, all of that happened after Abraham was justified. So there are many Christians who are justified because they believe the promise and yet they're in their Ishmael stage still trying to make it happen. And it's an illegitimate thing. It's adulterous. He went into Hagar, right? That is adultery. And what does Paul say about, and, and you know, in Galatians 4, he says that Hagar represents Sinai, which is the law. And remember in Romans 7, he said, uh, do you not know that a the if you're under the law, the husband has the right over the wife, that marriage is intact as long as the man lives, but you died to the law through the body of Christ through the, it, with it, when you died with him so that you may be rightfully joined to another so that you're not called an adulteress. And Paul shows us that trying to be married to the law while we're married to Christ is adultery. It's the first form of spiritual adultery. And didn't Abraham commit adultery when he went into Hagar to produce Ishmael? Ishmael is the fruit of adultery with the law. Trying to help God with your flesh is a kind of spiritual adultery. We need to stay true to Christ, pure to Christ, singly focused on Christ, joined to Christ, married to Christ, and let him be the real husband, the real head, who supplies everything and does everything. We need to recognize our role in that relationship, which is my husband, who is my head, t provides and does everything, and I am his fruit, you know. I'm, in, I'm his work, and he's cherishing me and nourishing me and washing me and purifying me and bringing forth his glory in this relationship. It's all of Christ. Okay, um, so that's all I have to say about that. Colleen did a, uh, Be Still and No did a good teaching on this today about the true circumcision, and we'll touch that a point some more later, uh, but that pretty much covers this little section.